Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have some major updates. Uh, Tim Alexander, are you there? And uh, John Moore and Ann Morrison, are you there? I'm here. Good. Uh, we have an update from uh, Tim Alexander. I can hear a lot of whooshing sound in the background. Sounds like somebody is probably out in their speedboat. I can hear some whooshing. Either that or they're in their car with with his cell phone open, door open. <laughs> the um, John, what, what's the latest on, uh, on what you're hearing from your contacts? Well, I, um, I, I spoke to my friend, Command Sergeant Major Page, earlier today. There's both active duty and reserve uh, military army on the streets of St. Louis, Missouri, in armored vehicles conducting patrols as we speak. Uh, they are armed. They do have the power of arrest. They are operating on their own, not with the St. Louis City Police. There is no martial law been declared. Uh, this is clearly and obviously in violation of posse comitatus. And uh, is this the, just a war game, or what? What's going on? Why would they? Well, think they, they, they say it's training, but but these men are in uniform and, and military vehicles, and they're armed, uh, patrolling with a, uh, to observe and make arrests of any criminal activity they may see or hear reported. Uh, the sheriff of St. Louis should do the right thing in order these uh, soldiers out of his city. The mayor of, of St. Louis, the governor of Missouri, uh, our, our U.S. senators and, and U.S. representatives should be protesting loudly that these federal troops are on the streets of St. Louis right now with no state of emergency and no martial law having been declared. Times are normal. Uh, there is no state of emergency. And we have armed uh, American troops in armored vehicles patrolling the, sa- the streets of St. Louis. And we we don't know how long they're going to be there. The press release is saying until next Thursday, but my confidential sources are telling me it could be much longer than that. Well, this is uh, tenderizing the American public. We're just waiting for the first possible crisis or pseudo-crisis to be able to do a lot worse. Um, let's hear the latest update now from Tim Alexander, which has a report from Syria. What's going on there? Tim. Well, this morning, uh, and there are conflicting reports, but uh, it appears that uh, the Syrian Air Defense Forces fired on two Turkish uh, Phantom II jet fighters. Uh, it's not clear whether they were the uh, uh, Israeli improved variant, the uh, F4E 2020. Uh, variant or the recon variant, the RF-4E. In any case, uh, a Syrian missile blew up one of the uh, Turkish aircraft uh, and it blew apart over uh, Syrian waters in the eastern Mediterranean. The other plane was damaged and evidently made its way back uh, into Turkey. Now, initially, the Turkish prime minister said that the uh, Syrians had done this and they had apologized. Howsoever, he's now retracted that. Uh, there are reports that the uh, Syrians were assisting the Turks, uh, or vice versa, in searching for these men. Some say the men have been uh, taken by the Syrians and are being held. Others say that the Turks have the men. They're both all right. Uh, it's a two-man crew in the Phantom. Um uh, now, uh, at this point in time, nobody's talking about invoking Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which requires all NATO, all 28 NATO uh, members to come to the aid of any member that's uh, attacked. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly sets things up for the, the next time. Uh, but we, we're still early stages into this. Uh, but what this probably was, was a twin RF-4E uh, uh, surveillance and tweaking mission uh, that was being closely watched by uh, NATO AWACS and EW aircraft as well as space and ground uh, observers. Uh, before you do an intrusion into heavily defended airspace, you try to tweak uh, their air defense systems to, to get them to turn them on and to see how they will respond. Uh, and certainly they responded very quickly. Uh, but, a, you know, that's, that's an old game in, in a good air defense system. They know that, and they have multiple layers, and, they, and they're, they're prepared not to give away all their secrets. Yeah, but, the other uh, thing is that the uh, Syrians are not slouches. 
they don't they're not a, a ragtag band of you know 20 or so tr tribal groups they're a cohesive military force that could be reckoned with with uh, russian and chinese support so right this is not, this and is not now be yesterday a, something happened dr bill that was very interesting a colonel a senior uh syrian air force officer defected uh, and, of course, the story in the Western media is he got in a jet fighter and took off and, and defected uh, by landing in Jordan. But here's the real story. Uh, the man, uh, and I'm probably going to mess up his name, Colonel Hassan Amare al I'm not even going to try it, Ham Hamadash, something like that. Uh, he was from a village in northern uh, Syria. Uh, let me find the village name here. Uh, M E L E S. How did they pronounce that in, in Arabic? And uh, it's in the Ibet district of northern Syria. His home and his village is controlled by the brutal foreign mercenaries that were hired by the U.S., uh, U.K., France, Israel, and the Gulf Cooperative uh, Council Powers. Uh, they were holding his wife and his four children and other family members hostage. And he was told that uh, he had no choice. He had to defect or else. So he took off using the cheapest and most obsolete fighter in the Syrian Air Force inventory, an old MiG-21. And uh, because he was a senior colonel, uh, you know, he didn't have clearance, but he just took off. And uh, about 90 seconds to two minutes later, he was uh, over a Jordanian airport and requesting uh, an emergency landing where he... Uh, quote unquote defected, uh, but you won't hear all that story uh, from most of the mainstream media. Uh, Divka is saying that this shoot down was a retaliation for that, but uh, I I think it was more an example of a tweaking. If they're tweaking, it is an indication that uh, a military strike against Syria is more apt to happen, or yeah. It is a, a psych op uh, against the Syrian uh, high command to make them think that it's it's apt to happen. Yeah, I, I personally don't think it's going to happen, and I'll tell you why. Because the Russians have made it very clear that an attack on Syria is a is a a prov prov provocatory attack that will precipitate World War III. The Chinese have made it very plain at the highest levels of their government. Uh, I believe that what we're seeing is going to be the outbreak of peace and not war. And even if there's a level of destruction, we're going to come within a hair's breadth of an international nuclear exchange, biological chemical exchange. And I can be certain that if this kind of uh, horse game is going on, it's going to mean that, these, that the uh, Iranians and Syrians will have their biological weapons armed and ready to release in cities all over the West. And we will immediately have biological plagues released that will be the most horrific in history. So there's no way... That, uh, that this is going to proceed with a war, what I believe is going to happen is they're going to come so close to destruction that they're going to have a new world order. This is all part of the game, I believe, to bring about the peace, that, that treaty which will partition the state of Israel. Uh, they're going to try to get some kind of peace treaty to kind of shackle the uh, Assad regime, but there's not going to be because there will be a future war where Damascus will be destroyed by nukes. It's obvious from the scriptures. And that Elam, which is the ancient area of the eastern of the western area of, of uh, Iran, where the oil is, will be struck as well, because this is going to be a big exchange, but it will be down the road. I believe that anything they start will get out of control so fast, we will have incoming nuclear missiles on American cities within minutes if any attack happens on Syria well, and Iran. it certainly has hair-triggered. The, the yeah. Israelis called up some additional reserves the other day They'll be uh, for the They'll Sinai be... area, <laughs> and they still have... Uh, Quite a few battalions. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many battalions. They can have 800 uh, nuclear missiles with multiply targeted warheads, and every single Israeli citizen, unless they're an underground nuclear bunker, will be dead within hours if That's they start correct. a conflict. There's no Guys, I have to go, but uh, God bless. We want to hear more from John Moore and Ann Morrison when we come back on the latest on military troop operations violating Posse Comitatus in St. Louis, and lots more coming down the pike here. We did a little radiation test, and want to go over that with Ann and John. And we flew up to Portland last week. Welcome back. Um, I want to give a little update to the uh, protocol, and I'm working on the data. I'm going to put together this weekend a, a live stream video of the pictures I took of the of the Inspector Plus 
Well, I re- flew up from last Thursday from San Diego Airport to uh, Portland Airport, and I measured it in counts per minute. It rose from 22 counts per minute to around 1,200 to 1,400. It rose relatively steadily, pretty quickly, actually, uh, and uh, even at 10, 12,000 feet, it was rising pretty fast. And then uh, when we descended, it dropped a little bit more gradually when I headed into Portland Airport. Flying back, I measured it in millisieverts per hour as well as counts per minute. It rose really rapidly this time, even at lower altitudes, to over 1,200 counts per minute. And then it dropped very precipitously after half an hour to about 600 to 700 counts per minute. And the millisieverts per hour dropped in half, which means the last two-thirds to three-quarters of the flight were at much lower radiation levels, even at high altitudes. So that means it was a radiation cloud. So this is what I proposed to Senator Wyden, is to have at least 100 aircraft flying commercial flights where they record their GPS coordinates and altitudes and send back millisieverts per hour and counts per minute directly to a database so we can create models of, this is an example, plume heading a south-south westerly direction over central Oregon, 300 miles wide between 1,500, sorry, between 15,000 and 2,500 feet, uh, and, and 25,000 feet, that tells you that 10,000 feet there's a radiation plume that you may want to divert around it or below it or above it because those air intakes mean you could have, if there's a massive release of radiation from cooling pool 4 or from one of the other reactors like reactor 2 that's going critical again, uh, a major radiation intake to those aircraft. And I personally like to be skeptical. I don't think the Alaska Airline pilots and stewardesses had bad dry cleaning. I think they flew through some very dense radiation plumes, and uh, there's background radiation flying in space anyway at 20,000, 30,000 feet, and we have the, the tables from NOAA. But if we have data, we can know what background is after this has been circulating around the planet dozens of times, hundreds of times perhaps since the uh, March 11, 2011. But we, if we see a massive increase in radiation while you're watching the counter, you can actually create a model a model space over the Pacific Ocean and over North America and Europe that will tell us where a plume is moving, how densely radioactive it is, and also civil defense responses of don't go out in the rain, wear your NIOSH masks, and so on. And that's where your expertise comes in. And what do you think of that idea of data collection in this manner? Oh, I think it's an excellent idea. <laughs> it's better than just ground-based idea of having a little rad rad stations telling us, oh, you're now being irradiated at such and such a level. We need advanced data to know where it's coming. And if it's crossing the Pacific, what's the speed of, of that plume movement? And uh, and how dense is it? And what radioisotope pattern does it have? So every aircraft, I also recommend, should have a little radon kind of capsule, like a carbon capsule. They later analyze it for the specific isotopes, like cesium-134, 137, and other isotopes. Um, yeah, we need to get data. And we, we have no data. We don't know what's going on. That's why the, the Alexander Higgins report made a, a mistaken analysis thinking it was mid-May when it was actually the 1st of April when there was a big burp of radioiodine 131 to over 240 counts uh, on that measurement scale. And it dropped back to a lower level, about one-tenth that, about a month later, which we know there's going to be major releases of radiation in the near future. Well, definitely, if, if Reactor 4, uh, if the building that surrounds Reactor 4 collapses, for instance, and that's been projected if there is an earthquake at the right spot and of the well, uh, correct magnitude. Big, two days ago, they had 6.4 within 75 miles. They also put a, I think it's 40 ton plus cap on top of Reactor Cooling Pool 4, which means they can't either extract the fuel rod uh, assemblies or uh, go in there and even inject more water, and they have had great trouble trying to repair those pumps to keep the cooling pool uh, cool enough. So this is a chewing gum and bailing wire and chewing gum kind of operation. And at some point, not only that, but cooling reactor 2 is showing criticality, indicating that they're going to have hydrogen explosions and criticality causing uh, lots of nasty things happening. So uh, it's inevitable the place is going to be unfit for anybody to even service it. Well, I, I I think that's right. And I, I, I saw that they were going to try to put a cap on the pool, and you're saying that they did that finally. They did that, um, but it puts extra weight on the top of the structure, which we know from neutron annealing and from the structural damage of the earthquakes, it makes it even more likely to fall over. Yes. Uh, you know, trying to uh, correct design flaws after the fact is <laughs> only creates more design flaws. <laughs> And yeah, we know that either. from San Onofre because what they're saying is that when they went in to replace the um, cooling tubes in San Onofre, that uh, they, they, what, the way they 
ordered them was that they could replace them with with tubes that were like the ones that were in there. Well, they the ones they replaced them with didn't look anything like the ones that were in there. And they had a faulty software design uh, over in Japan. Mitsubishi was the one that they lent the contract to. And their de- their software design for those tubes was faulty, and they know that. Yeah, I know. And the yet, fact is they try to say like for like, which means they don't have to do engineering studies. It's not like for light, and they put more steam tubes on that uh, what's called a steam tube plate and were actually certified in the original design so they actually did what's called engineering prestidigitation which is a trick in magic uh, where basically they they lied basically essentially they lied and our NRC our, our nuclear regulatory commission um, they 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 let them <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just that's why that, that's why Jasco's gone because he was a stickler, and they had to remove him because the nuclear industry would say, "Oh no, 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 Mr. Jasco, you're being too much of a stickler. You're stopping us from making San Onofre turn into Fukushima. We wanted to become Fukushima. We want to irradiate 26 million people in Southern California and downwind. What's wrong with you, Mr. Jasco? You have too many rules, don't you?" Well, he's gone now, and I haven't heard anything out of the new commissioner. Part so of the new commissioner may be tough, too, though, which is good. She's a geologist, and she has a, re- a past history that she's not so easy on the industry. So I have a feeling that uh, the nuclear industry, as it's being managed now, is dead. And unless they start uh, completely designing new reactors that are safe for tokamak fusion reactors, protests around the world against Japan are going to get much more violent. Um, I think that this uh, martial law, and I want to tie this together, is they're expecting some kind of event happening. And it may well be Fukushima, it could be a bank holiday in Europe, but the the movement of officers in St. Louis is a good example of in your face, we're going to do violate com- posse comitatus, we're going to do whatever we want, and you can't protest because you're just citizens, and we're going to do what we'd like. Uh, so I have a feeling they're expecting either a bank holiday, uh, who knows, a coronal mass ejection, not going to power, but the top priority thing I think is going to happen is a... Massive release of radiation from Fukushima this summer, at least a, a, the first of many burps of radiation. Uh, I see the meltdown of the European economy by the fall, and I see a bank holiday either the, you know, mid-fall before the elections. I, I see it coming. I could be wrong. It's only prediction. It's not a prophecy. But this is what I see on the timeline right now. It seems to be telling me, especially with the St. Louis thing, that the government thinks that if they call a bank holiday and all of a sudden everybody's money is frozen and they don't have food in their refrigerator or gasoline in their engines, they expect to have to use martial law to control a population that's going to go crazy. Well, I wanted to ask John about that. John, are you on? I'm here. Okay, I was just wondering, yeah. if, you know, let's say that I'm walking along the street and, and one of these vehicles pulls up and, and says, uh, we want you to come with us. Uh, what do I do? Well, they'll be big, tough, armed guys, so you'll have little choice. Okay. Unless yeah. you're walking around with a flak jacket on and a shotgun and a Kevlar helmet and a bad <laughs> attitude and a rock and propel grenade hanging over your shoulder or whatever, then you kind of look at them and grin with all your teeth, including your uh, <laughs> silver caps, and, uh, is, and uh, say, no, sir. Uh, lots of interesting reports. Um, do we have Chris Harris there? No, Chris hasn't made it. Okay. The latest report we have from Chris, we talked about this yesterday, is that uh, the situation in Fukushima is deteriorating. Uh, that's likely to, to go further. We have from John today the report that they're doing military operations without proper uh, approval by the sheriff in the area of St. Louis, which is very serious. I mean, this is the kind of, of things that actually can get... Uh, uh, obviously, they're doing these type of operations in the open so that they, they're tenderizing the public to say what kind of, they want to see what kind of response the public has to these kind of violations. This is not a, a, an acceptable, quote, war game. And why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it because they want you to know that they expect some disaster to happen where they can actually pull the trigger and all these executive orders that the usurper in chief has done and the previous presidents 
will activate, plus the violation of your constitutional rights, your violation of the habeas corpus, and even the power of the local authorities, such as the sheriff, are taken and, and, and affected. So why is this happening? I see a menu uh, I call the devil's menu. Number one, I think, on the top of the list is Fukushima is likely to blow real soon, probably within the next few months. Number two, bank holiday likely after a collapse of the banks. Fifteen of the banks were downrated by Moody's, uh, and we know the Europeans can't service their debt. So that's going to happen. We know bank holiday is coming. It could be, I think, as early as October. It could be next year, but I think it's going to happen sooner. Third thing is we're having really strange signs in the heavens. Coronal mass ejections. We had another bunch that glanced the earth just uh, last week. Uh, right now it's really quiet. Tell us the latest update, Anne, in terms of what's happening with earthquakes, volcanoes, and earth changes, and what's likely to happen in the next, say, few months. Well, right now, you know, we just passed the uh, summer solstice, and the summer solstice is uh, no longer at the perihelion. Perihelion is when the earth is the furthest away from the sun. Uh, perihelion will occur on July 5th, so uh, then the earth will start traveling back closer to the sun. So uh, right now the earthquakes have been down actually for the last two months. The last big earthquakes were April 11th and 12th. And uh, uh, we haven't had any large earthquakes, any in over seven since, since uh, for the last two months. So I'm expecting them maybe on the equinox. By that time the earth will be closer to the, to the sun and there'll be more gravitational pull and we may uh, experience a large earthquake. Of course, we can experience a large earthquake any time. <clears throat> it's just that it's been very strange that we've had half as many. We used to have about 400 earthquakes per week. I mean, that was just typical. That's what I expected to see when I went up to the USGS site. And now all I see is 200, and they aren't big. You know, the the, the uh, magnitude has gone down and the number has gone down. So I think the energy is amassing someplace, and I don't know where it is. It could be any place that's active. We have two volcanoes, uh, Popocatl Petal in Mexico that is distributing ash uh, into Mexico City, and then we have Nevada de Rio Ruiz in Colombia, and that's on the Mediterranean side of South America. So we know the Caribbean area is seismically active, and of course, uh, Indonesia is seismically active, it always is, in Japan. And so anytime, um, well, you just, you just don't know when these things will strike. Um, we missed the summer solstice. We may, it might hit at perihelion, but I, I somehow I doubt it. I think it'll probably be more by the equinox before we can expect anything, and that'll be in September. So we do have volca- we do have seismic activity, but we don't have as uh, our earthquake activity is is very low. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of good. Um, we also just saw the bigger earthquake though just last week uh, off of uh, Chiba, off of Japan, six point four. And uh, we know that these reactors aren't going to tolerate any more big shaking. So a 7.0 earthquake is going to almost certainly bring down not only this one, but the reactor up in Dianyi. And they started, uh, they have plans now next week to release the UE uh, reactor number three and four. They're planning on restarting them, which is pretty crazy because apparently there's been a lot of seismic activity in those regions since last year. So here in North America, we don't hear anything further from JASCO. Um, uh, John and Anne, what are your opinions about what's going on with the GOP race? What do, what do you see happening there? What's going on with what, Dr. Bill? The uh, GOP race, because I've got uh, some oh. interesting <laughs> different reports. Firstly, uh, it's interesting what's going on inside the, uh, the so-called Republican GOP. We have Rand Paul going in a different direction than Ron Paul. We have, uh, we have Romney, we call Tweedledee and Tweedledum, both of them what I call not really uh, Christian candidates for president between Obama and uh, Romney. Romney now looks like he's trying to, to backpedal on the idea of illegal immigrants and not dealing with it properly. There is a proper way to deal with it, but he's certainly not doing that. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, without his base, I can't see how Romney can get elected. I think the best asset for Obama, considering how badly he screwed up the economy and how terrible all these laws and presidential edicts he's done, his best asset is Romney, because Romney seems to be just completely incompetent. It's amazing. It's like a, a replay of John McCain Allowing Romney, allowing Obama to be elected in the first place. Right. Well, Mitt Romney was put there for that specific purpose, and you figured it out, Dr. Bill. 
Yeah, it, it, that's what it appears to me. I mean, I, I can't see how Obama has done so many horrendous things that should have got him impeached already. He should be already in impeachment proceedings right now uh, for multiple reasons. Well, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of ironic. The, the peace candidate will be engaged in wars longer than World War II in his administration as of October. Uh, World yeah. War II was uh, three years and nine months, and uh, that's where we'll be in October is three years and ten months wow. of these wars. Yeah, and of course. Uh, the American involvement in World War II, I should say, three years about, and ten, nine months. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, uh, the abominator, of course, it, gets, it seems to be doing a lot more activity in terms of predator drone kills, uh, the promising of banking and other assets to the Europeans, and military assets to Israel to do an attack, which is totally insane because the Russians and Chinese have basically stated that any kind of action like this will be an act of war, not against Syria and Iran, but against Russia. Um, so there's a lot of analyses as to what uh, will, will transpire. Um, what do you think is going to happen in the next few months? Well, the, as um, we heard at the beginning of the show, this, uh, McD this McDonnell Douglas uh, F-4 being shot down, that's a Vietnam Air aircraft, by the way, and they still regard it as a high-performance jet aircraft. Uh, being shot down, it's an act of war, obviously, and clearly it's an act of war, a provocation. Um, it's Syria getting in the face of Turkey and saying, uh, you know, you can't do this, give it your best shot. Um, so the, the, we're beyond saber railing. When, when jet fighters are being shot down, we're past talk, we're past threats. Uh, that's, that's an act of war in and of itself. And you're right, Dr. Bill, Syria is a first-tier client state of, of Soviet Union, has been for a number of decades, and they've got state-of-the-art uh, air defense systems uh, and communications and aircraft and so forth, all of which are maintained with uh, technicians and spare parts from Moscow. Uh, so there's nothing to be taken lightly. This is not some defective third-world country that whose army consists of uh, beat-up Toyota pickup trucks with machine guns mounted on the back of them. We're way past that. This is a sophisticated military that has serious uh, capabilities. Yeah, exactly. Plus, they have the S-300 anti aircraft system, and what I've been told is they have the most advanced chemical and uh, fuel air bombs, and the Russian-based uh, biological weapon systems that were shared between Iran and Syria. Uh, and the Russians have upgraded their radar system, which is why these jets were knocked down. There may have been surveillance jets when it came into near uh, Syrian airspace on the border. It's not surprising. It should kind of tell the powers that be that this is really a stupid thing to keep on pushing this envelope. And I have reports that Special Forces, MI6, uh, British uh, SAS, and uh, Blackwater Security, now called Academy, are inside Syria and Iran trying to do a core domain, which is a, ca a decapitation of the regimes. But uh, this is very, very dangerous. Welcome back, and we see some interesting things happening on the political realm. We see uh, Rand Paul withdrawing his, uh, his stellar support for Romney. It looks like Rubio is going to become the vice presidential candidate. Romney's latest comments suggested that he's basically doing a carte blanche trying to trump the Obama's uh, endorsement of basically an open citizenship thing. What needs to happen is something that's rational and not crazy. We need to have our military on the border to prevent uh, invasion. We need to have a system set up to allow people who are not criminals to get citizenship over a number of years like any other citizen. We need to take them out of the shadows so they can't be abused by employers. We need to also have students that are flying over here from China that get an approval to do citizen work here as a student. They don't just, quote, stay after work and work at a restaurant in Los Angeles or end up in a, in a sweatshop somewhere because they're illegals. Uh, but that's not happening. We're not hearing a rational response from either Obama or Romney uh, on this issue. And we don't correct it, tr protect the borders. And uh, what I've heard is that the latest number of illegals are not from Mexico, they're from Asia. The largest number of new Ill illegals are coming from Asia. Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? And, of course, the uh, situation with the economy is it's, it's not doing as well as they say. They keep on lying to us and tell us what's going on. Um, 
I think that all these are coming together are suggesting that the government's expecting a major breakdown. That's why they're doing all these open air war game simulations like in St. Louis because they want to kind of find out if the population will push back. Well, the pushback is get your guns, get your gun training, get your food and supplies, be ready to vote for uh, pro life uh, constitutional candidates like Tom Hoffling. That's Tom Hoffling, H O E F L I N G dot com. And be prepared to. Uh, neutralize either candidate to get some power if they want to do unconstitutional actions, including violating posse comitatus. And if they bring foreign troops on American soil or American troops and they continue, they decide that they're going to start using violence against citizens, then be prepared with your local sheriff and the proper authorities to deal with uh, removing these uh, violations of authority from your district or territory. Well, what are you going to do, Dr. Bill? I mean, they're driving tanks around the streets. Easy to blow off the you know, things off tanks. Tanks can be dealt with. T- tanks are a lot more uh, easily attacked than people think. Uh, firstly, uh, you can blow the, th- the, the, the belts off tanks very easily. Uh, secondly, uh, tanks have air intakes, and you can easily deal with that. That's easy to deal with. Um, and, of course, they run out of fuel. They use a lot of fuel up, and before you know it, they have to get out of the tank, and uh, that makes them very vulnerable. Uh, if you uh, literally block roads with material... They can't get around them, and if they try to get around them, they become extremely vulnerable, which is why the tanks going into cities like in uh, Damascus or these other cities in Syria, how uh, tank uh, type any tank weapons can easily take people out of tanks. Same way as uh, low-lying aircraft, it's easy to deal with those with all kinds of uh, technologies that are available. So it's not a one-way street. Uh, if the citizenry really wants to resist these things, they really can't get away with it. Dr. Billy, make it sound so simple. Yeah, well, I think, we need, I think we need to start preparing. I, as you said in the military, we need to have uh, people put to, I call, don't necessarily join the militia, but join, a, you know, practice with three or four man groups. There's a lot of people with military skills that can train their buddies uh, and then join gun, gun clubs and be prepared. If the, if the government knows there's enough citizens that are going to push back, they won't try it. That's well, why the uh, first thing, the action of Obama... If there's enough to push back, they won't. Uh, Hollywood, I'm not sure how they would acquire that knowledge. Of, uh, well, they, do, they, yeah. they acquire that knowledge by doing something outlandish, like turning something like this into an actual shooting game where they actually start shooting citizens. And then they find out the pushback is we surround the tanks, we blow up the roads so they can't get out, and then the people inside the tanks end up finding that they're going to die. Well, in... in uh, in dense in dense urban areas, that is not a place for tanks to operate. The, exactly. And the tankers, the tankers be the first one to tell you, they feel really, really vulnerable in narrow urban streets of, of uh, brick and concrete structures. Uh, they can't maneuver. They can't see. Uh, and anybody who's aware of, of countermeasures uh, to use against tanks would just uh, lick their lips and be ready to uh, up these tanks. Exactly. Yeah, there's lots of ways of doing it. So, uh, you know, without getting into too many details, people need to realize that uh, a well-armed citizenry that's willing to push back, uh, they won't try it because they can't get away with it. And, by the way, we do need to have civil defense, too, to also... I was told this when I worked with the government that within 4 to 12 days of any civil breakdown, whether it's in the swine avian flu, and for those people that said, oh, Dr. Deagle, you prophesied this and that. I didn't. I gave a percentage. We got a report yesterday... Yesterday published it. Now they, they have said clearly that the swine avian flu is going to now be weaponized and released, and that it will be a matter of time. Now, I don't know when it would happen. And when I said this report two or three years ago, let's put it this way: we had ten times as many children died a couple of years ago with the swine flu than was normal. Okay, uh, lots of people got it. Lots of people called me. We gave them nutraceuticals for it, and we saved their lives. When this comes back in a full force or this release of a biological weapon, millions will die. This is not a joke. This is very, very serious. And when we have Fukushima release radiation, it's gonna, it's, we're slowly being poisoned. All of us are getting thorium in our urine. We're slowly being poisoned. And massive burps of radiation are going to make our food radioactive. And, in, and fertility and birth defects and anybody vulnerable, the unborn, the, uh, the premature babies, people very sick and very you know, fragile systems, uh, the elderly, people that have serious health problems, it's going to push them over the edge. 
And people say, oh, that's all theoretical. No, it's not. They come up with mortality, morbidity reviews, a lot of attacks on it. Nobody's been able to, to, to prove that the attacks are not valid, that the, the data is not valid, that within the first three months, over 20,000 premature babies under a year of age died after Fukushima in North America. This is five to 8,000 miles away. So uh, people are trying to think that this is just a conspiracy theory. They need to get a reality check. <clears throat> the government's fully aware that they're just waiting to pounce on the public with any kind of disaster from a bank holiday to a swine avian flu to a burper radiation. And that's why they're not doing anything. They're not carrying aircraft to make sure that they don't carry a biohazard. They're not doing any data collection or displaying it to the public to know of radiation plumes coming over your city or town. They're not encouraging the sheriffs and the civilians to actually go beyond just knowing how to duct tape up your windows, but to have civil defense where we have proper authority through the sheriff. All citizens know how to operate guns and work in small groups to protect their community from gangs that would take over within 4 to 12 days. Gangs would take over everything if our citizens don't, because the military is not big enough, even if we invited 100,000 or 500,000 is, it's not big enough to control a, a country as large as America with 325 million people. <clears throat> so with a little civilian defense, you're going to have civilian chaos, and gangs will run everything. That's very true. Uh, these military and, and police, they could, they could protect critical infrastructure, uh, hospitals, power yeah. plants, dams, bridges, and, yeah, airports like that. and so forth. But yeah. that, just to do that would take up all their people. Yeah, and, and the, the critical infrastructure the military could take, you know, freeways and critical stuff. But even then, they'd be stretched. Uh, and the uh, as far as the rest of the community, if the civilian defense is not ready, and that means it has bad teams to deal with, you know, toxic stuff. Uh, the reason biological weapons, if there was a biological weapon release and there was a plague spreading, uh, people don't even have proper training know how to deal with decon and reverse protection. No, they don't. And most likely there would be a vaccine offered that would be just as bad, if not worse. Exactly, yeah. In fact, uh, one thing to be certain, they're talking about a universal vaccine against the flu. I tell people what you need to do is daily be taking our nutraceuticals, have your radiation kit, and as Ann says, you might want to go over these couple of steps, Ann. If we, and let's say that Senator Wyden and Senator Dianne Feinstein gets this bill passed that says, look, civilian airliners are going to present this data. You could log on, go on your cell phone, which, by the way, they're selling so these soft bank cell phones in Japan now that have a radiation detector. If a radiation plume was moving over your town or city, what would you do? If you could go on your cell phone or your iPad or your computer and it told you, oh, oh at such and such a mile per hour, there's a plume moving into your town or city or area of the country, what would you do? Well, what you do is you would uh, move at right angles to that as fast as you can, and you have about uh, an hour or two hours before the before the uh, <laughs> before you you start getting the radioactive particles falling on you. And uh, so, what you want to do is you don't want to go um, with the plume or against the plume. You want to go at right angles to it so you can get away from it. Now, you have to understand that the authorities will send up perimeters. And if you're in the inside perimeter, they won't let you out, even if you get to the to the perimeter, because they'll just figure that you're contaminated and they'll make you go through a decontamination process. Well, you talk 100,000 people caught in a perimeter, that decontamination process is going to take days. Yeah, we, we, we're going to post some more information on our live stream channel. By the way, our live stream channel will be available for all of our customers in the last six months. Uh, that's going to happen uh, right after the show today. So we'll be putting up reports. And by the way, our special contributors, John Moore, his website is thelibertyman.com, and Morrison is homeland-defenseforyou.com. They'll be posting up reports as necessary, and we'll have these up on live stream as they happen seven days a week. 